since the assembly was founded in the year 2000, the Greens have been represented on it. So 23 years, the Green Party has had seats on the London Assembly. What do you think are the big achievements the Greens have had over that time? Well, I mean, we could do an hour and a half on this if you want it. <laughs> I mean, I've got to start with um, Darren and Jenny's achievements because because they had an extraordinary period where Ken Livingston was the mayor and didn't have enough votes on the assembly because we've got lovely PR um, to pass his own budget. So that meant he had to come to us and make a deal every year. Um, and they got some really, really fundamental things sorted out during that period. They got the living wage unit in the GLA set up that actually started to sit down properly to calculate what a living wage ought to be. And that is that, um, you know, they've changed who does the calculations now. The Living Wage Foundation do it. I've got, you know, a little bit of beef with with some of their calculations. But the core methodology, the fact that you look at the, the amount you need to live off sensibly and then you work out what the wage should be is is there and was established properly by you know economists and all those all those kind of people that the establishment takes seriously as a result of the greens putting money into that there's there's loads of other things they did though i think one of the the most iconic is um the way they dealt with the thames gateway bridge which people might not know was a was a very large motorway bridge that was going to be built across the Thames. The successor scheme to that is the Silvertown Tunnel, which uh, Boris Johnson revived and now Sadiq Khan is pursuing. But that was a plan by Ken Livingston to build a big road in London, which was just the weirdest thing. We we couldn't understand why he was doing that, given so many of his other policies on transport were pretty, pretty good. Um, and what we did with the budget there, we couldn't, you know, we had power, but we didn't have enough power simply to say this needs to be cancelled right now. That was, you know, it's part of his manifesto. He was going to do it. But we got money given to the objectors, the, the green groups, the local residents to, again, put money into expert research, expert testimony at the public inquiry, which ultimately defeated that plan. <laughs> so that kind of clever ways to empower residents to have their own say in a credible way to change policy was was just a really really clever bit of work um i mean other things they did and work they started that that we've carried on with are things like the uh work for estate residents darren johnson's work um some really good reports on that that came out um in the years before i became an assembly member were the basis for a lot of my work and we've taken that on since then, uh, we've won ballots for residents on the state, which are a start. They're not perfectly set up. So I, you know, the last thing I did on this last summer was publish a report showing where there are uh, issues with, with landlords still having a bad attitude towards their residents and, and not running the ballots properly, trying to get those rules changed. That's work I continue supporting residents across London. Um, and that's important ongoing work. I mean, it's not always about the big the big policies and the big sudden you know changes you can often just build power for for people in london build support in a in a more ongoing way um and then sorry it's a very long answer because you've given me a bit of a long question i'm afraid um and then more recently i have to say i'm you know i'm really proud of the work we did on youth services um turning that from something the mayor recognised there was a problem with councils cutting youth services, big squeeze due to austerity on council budgets. Young people were coming off worse, you know, maybe because they don't vote when you're under 18. You know, those are all issues that led to this. But the mayor started off, the current mayor, Sadiq Khan, started off saying, I don't believe that's my job. I believe that's the council's job. When I started saying, can you put some money into youth services? Eventually did turn around and recognise that he had a public health role, he had a role in supporting young people in London and has put tens of million, millions of pounds back into youth services. And that's, you know, that's made a genuine difference on the ground. And, you know, it was our work that did it. The mayor himself often brings up spontaneously saying that it was our influence that made him do that. And I just think that's that's absolutely fantastic. We're three quarters of the way now to doing the same thing with toilets which is really exciting. Um, transport for London. I don't know if you, you know, if you come to London, you'll, you will know that there is not, when you get on the tube, there is not a sign in every tube station going, here are the toilets, like you get at a normal station, because they don't 
they haven't really believed that their job was to provide public toilets as part of the transport system. That's just wrong. And and we have got all the way to getting the, as in we, Caroline Russell, who is our absolute leader on the toilets issue, um, has got all the way to getting the Assembly passing a budget amendment um, at the first meeting where we have to get a simple majority to pass a budget amendment to put money back into putting toilets into stations. And then at the final budget meeting, I, at the very beginning, I said, you know, you need you need to have a two thirds majority to change the budget. Um, Ken Livingston used to need our votes for that. Currently, um, we have a majority on the Assembly who are not Labour members. All of those members voted to put money into toilets in the final budget meeting. So it was left to the Labour group alone to block that. So we had a lot of publicity for the headline Labour blocks toilets, which I'm very proud of. Well, you're in his own right. And I think that publicity, the fact that they've been politically embarrassed for not standing by something which is so obvious and so affordable and something we put forwards in a properly worked out amendment. I just think that's going to happen. But but we'll see. That's for that's for this year coming. So you said earlier that I asked you a really big question, which was 23 years of green successes, which was big. I'm going to ask you another massive question now, uh, which is... I did that in like uh, six so minutes. So, you know, some credit, please. Thank you. Yeah, very, very well done. Uh, you covered less... What's that like? Uh, one one year, three, three years in a minute or something like that. Um, but uh, the next question I wanted to put to you is uh, equally big. So you're obviously in the Assembly uh, holding Sadiq Khan to account. What is your and the Green Party's biggest critique of how Sadiq Khan has been running London? Oh, I mean, we sit there, you know, every month we sit there and we ask him questions and and we see, you know, we see him going about doing his publicity. And um, I have to say, you know, there's 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 a lack of vision. There's a lack of leadership and a lack of really decisive action, particularly on the climate. There's there's far too many ways in which. He will half do something like the ultra low emission zone. He first of all took it to the north and south circulars, which leaves out, you know, in area and in population, most Londoners from protection from from dirty air. Um, and and now he's doing the whole of London because he should have done it in the first place. It was it was almost before the initial expansion came in that he recognised it needed to be London wide. So that was you know, a terrible error on his part. And by leaving it, by doing it in two stages, by leaving it till now, when there's a really frightening, growing um, right wing, joined up conspiracy type situation where people are really exercised about absolutely anything that happens on our streets and prepared to be quite violently um oppositional to it now we're we're making we as london are making the ultra emission zone london wide um that's facing an enormous backlash which could have been avoided if he just had the vision and the strength to put it forwards as a london wide measure in the first place and there are quite a few things like like that um i think particularly on climate we've seen uh, a big scandal recently where they put some money into supporting solar panels on people's roofs, which is a nice thing, um, and then outsourced the entire program. So didn't you know? Didn't want to keep it in house, didn't want to 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 make it a proper GLA initiative. You know, weren't keeping their eye on things. And one of the so that they they subcontract they contracted it to a choosing app who then contracted subcontracted a um a company to do some of these installations who turned out to be and i don't think i'll be sued for saying this um complete cowboys <laughs> basically and i you know my inbox is absolutely full of people um you know, i would say dozens and dozens probably over a hundred people have written to me saying this company's let me down can you help and, and i've been doing that i've been sending the the cases off to the mayor's team but the the fundamental problem lies in underpowering and outsourcing this program and it's you know it's that kind of thing and then thirdly the the last thing i'd add is on too many things he shrugs his shoulders and says the government need to do this and you know that's you, you, we've had the big battle over transport for london funding and that has been, you know, you can see the government exercising its elbow and trying to 
um, tell London what to do, trying to, you know, micromanage things like what pension schemes we have. And, you know, that that has been their big thing. But then there are many, many other issues where he, he does the same thing. And, and that's, you know, that's how he started out with youth services as well. And that's his natural instinct. And, and I think for someone who's, sta- who's supposed to stand up for the city and represent the city um, and all of Londoners do deserve a stronger voice, a firmer voice for them ag- against the government, but also doing things, showing the government what can be done is more of what he should be doing rather than just blaming the government. And so you mentioned some of this already, but what are the big things that you're working on in the Assembly right now? Oh, um, so you've caught us right in the, because it's April and there are no meetings in April. We're in the Easter. Happy Easter, by the way. I hope you're enjoying your four day weekend. Um, So we're in the Easter break and we're leading up to our final year of this Assembly term. So uh, me and Caroline and Zach, we're doing all our our planning ahead um, and seeing what it is we can finish off what we can get through what we can finally get sorted out during our final year so so for Caroline there's a really exciting thing about to happen she's about to be chair of the police and crime committee now I don't think I I prepared to be wrong about this I don't think we've ever had that chair as a green group in the assembly before and the year that it's happened is the most crucial year for scrutiny of the police the police need to absolutely transform themselves or or else basically mm-hmm. and the the Casey report that just came out um confirmed a lot of what we already knew a lot of the criticisms we've been making of the police um for years are, are reflected in that with evidence they have to sort that out and Caroline's job as chair of the committee is not just to sit there and you know spout our, our opinions it's to 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 shape the scrutiny that takes place, to make sure that all of the things that are in KCR are are discussed, that the police are held to account for what they absolutely need to do next. And I just don't think we could have a better chair of the committee than Caroline on this one. She's she's been so good since she took over the scrutiny of the police and so convincing and calm and relentless. She's been working on child strip search for a while now, and you'll have seen the the evidence that came out this week about the racial bias that's in that you know we we were we've been asking questions about that and getting them not answered by the police for for some time and that kind of um what's the word determination relentlessness in asking the right questions is something she's so good at so that's that's really exciting um Zach's work is also we've got a huge opportunity because um, he chairs, He has chaired the Environment Committee for two years. He's our lead on environment and climate. He's just done a really good thing in the committee, which is get all the all the groups um, to agree by you know by consensus a, a policy that there shouldn't be um, airport expansion at, at City Airport, and that's something you know, we haven't got all the parties to agree on before. It's something Sadiq Khan didn't didn't agree on when he first came in. So that's just really good work getting getting a consensus around that. But we've also had for the first time this year, the mayor attempting to put numbers on his budget that actually show the climate impact of the measures that we're, we're paying money for. And we've got 20 billion pounds in our budget each year. So that's a lot. Um, and this year's tables were not amazing, but they were a start. There were there were there were errors. There, there's lots missing. Um, each of the different parts of the GLA are laying out some projects essentially that they might do that affect our climate impact. By next year, we need that to be very rigorous, and, and Zach will be spending a lot of time on that. Um, and my jobs are transport and housing and planning. Um, I've got an awful lot to do on, I think, fares this year um, because fares have gone up um, two years in a row now um, and they are really unfair. Um, You know, we're not we're not seeing the the right division of payments between different people traveling in different ways across London. So I've got a lot of work to do on that. Um, And then in housing and planning, um, I think the, the most exciting idea out there at the moment is the idea that we must be switching ten years between homes that already exist. You'll, you know, you'll know that that the housing debate is always about shouting out numbers of homes that we need to build, and then then you get into a big row between you know 
what so-called NIMBYs and so-called YIMBYs about what gets built where. And actually the biggest impact we can make on um, people's lives is not the, the tiny percentage of new homes that get built each year, but what happens to the homes that already exist. And we've started to be able to show that it's good value for the government, for councils, to purchase homes from private landlords to increase the social housing stock. Um, and we're starting to, we being sort of me talking about it in the assembly, which I've been doing for a while, but also you've got um, think tanks and NGOs out there who are doing the work. Neff produced a really good report on this recently. The Smith Institute, um, worth looking up as well. Um, there's, there's various people thinking, actually, we do need to do work to, to reverse the impact of right to buy to switch 10 years back to the sort of mix we used to have because there's no quicker way of doing it and in terms of the costs and benefits it, it completely works it, it, it can it completely works even when you're not counting things like health benefits it's good value to do it and so you'll like you'll like that chris won't you so so bringing bringing housing back into public hands is essentially the the mission for this year and and my goal is to make it, again, a consensus issue so that every party is talking about how many homes they'll do this with rather than just whether or not we should do it by the time of the next election. So that's all our strategy. I hope everyone in the other parties is taking notice. <laughs> and so that so segues... You disagree the, with that. The it's question. all good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> go Absolutely. On. So in terms of strategy, uh, so obviously Londoners are going to go to the uh, polls next May, so in a year's time. And uh, for, for viewers who don't know, the Greens have had between th two and three Assembly members for the whole of the 23 years of the Assembly's existence. Obviously, in May next year, you're hoping to get more seats and so that you can spread some of that incredibly busy workload that you've got between more and get more Green representatives and so on. Um, what are the issues the Greens are going to be prioritising in those elections next year? Ah, yeah, well, that's a really good point, actually. The fact that we've had Zach um, added to me and Caroline for the last three years has been absolutely amazing. You know, the amount of extra work we've been able to do, the amount of um, additional issues we've been able to put full, um, you know, full focus on has been has been huge. Um, we are we are absolutely aiming to gain more assembly members next year. And we've got a fantastic new candidate for mayor um, who will be elected to the assembly if we if we increase our numbers as well. Um, that's Zoe Garbett. And I know you've you've had her on um she's got really good track record as a councillor in Hackney as a candidate for mayor in Hackney she got 17 percent in that mayor election um which is a lot more than the eight I got when I stood for mayor last so you know we're expecting a lot from Zoe there um but also I think you know the issues she brings in are really exciting as well um, Caroline's done some work on reducing drug harm, for example. But the reason we we knew Zoe in the first place is because she'd spent all that time on the, the drugs policy working group, really sorting out the Green Party's drugs policies, you know, updating them, not, not changing them utterly because they were kind of they were right in the first place, but making them really practical, getting the, you know, the details updated for for a new age and really focusing on the public health aspects of it and she works in public health so i think that is going to be a key part of our our platform like drawing on zoe's experience with the drugs issue but also in the wider public health sphere as well because so so many of the policies we talk about you know we're shouting out numbers of homes like i said really what we're talking about here is giving people a healthy environment to, to grow up particularly children you know an overcrowded home a moldy home incredibly bad for your health for your mental health for your education if we're talking about a public health approach to everything that will be a really really good election um focus for us um but obviously there are you know there are wider issues Zoe's also been really good at um looking at the over policing of um people from um minority groups um she stood up for the um the, the the riders who do the food deliveries who who faced a um a really aggressive police raid um right in her ward and she was straight out there like on the streets she was liaising with the the mayor of hackney to make sure that they they weren't necessarily just taking the police line on what this was all about um she's she's a really clear thinker and a really good 
activist. She has all the right instincts. I'm just really looking forward to, to what she does in the next year and, and how that campaign goes with her on the on the platform. Because one thing we've been able to do with the mayor, I think, is the current mayor is influence him by just modelling a kind of politics that he actually can't help but be impressed by and then tries to emulate on things like the police you know on things like rent controls he's he's seen us advocating for things and and actually changed his rhetoric to match and I think that is an influence we can have and I think Zoe being up on that platform will be really really exciting you'll have to listen to a new green he's used to us now you'll have to listen to a new green and that'll be that'll be really interesting to see what happens so as you've mentioned Zoe and the mayoral campaign there I just wanted to ask you one thing about that which is obviously the three times that you've stood to be London mayor you've stood under a system where uh, voters get a first and a second preference vote uh, next year will be the first time the election takes place under the antiquated undemocratic first past the post what impact do you think that's going to have on the greens campaign i'll be honest i don't think it's going to have that much impact at all and particularly not on the votes because the the tories and the labor party have always fought the mayor election as if it was first past the post um and they're the ones with all the all the reach so all the election adverts that you saw from um the you know current mayor from the conservatives we're all that classic you know don't vote for us or, or you'll let the tories in don't vote green or you'll let the tories in. all of that was all of that rhetoric was all, always flying around and we've always had to to fight it to get the vote that we get in the mayor election so i don't think it'll make any difference to that election particularly what it might do which is quite quite nice is there are a lot of people out there who voted second preference for mayor um you know i've i've uh, last election, I got the most second preferences of any candidate. Um, it was over 20 percent of people cast their second vote for the Greens. Um, and they like doing that. We know that they like doing that. We've, you know, we've talked to people. Um, it's something that they feel like that is a, you know, is a, is a statement of their own values. And if they can't give that statement as an X in the second preference box, then more of them might use it for an X in the in the assembly um election so that i think bodes very well for us getting the the extra extra votes that we need to get to get five or more assembly members at the moment we only need about one percentage point more to get another to get a fourth assembly member we were quite close we were on the upper end of that um scale before that's that's a that's a target we can very much aim at but if more people do feel like their vote for the Greens needs to go somewhere, then it goes on the Assembly, then we could get even more. So I I... you agree with that, Chris? Sorry, because I know you're you're a you're a an analyst of all of this. Do I agree with that? That's an interesting question. I think <laughs> um, I think it depends what the media do, right? Because if the media change the way they report on the election and present it even more as a two horse race, I think that could have significant ramifications um so i think that that would be a worry for me in terms of the greens campaign if if the if the media goes well this is now first past the post there's literally no chance that anyone else is going to get in so uh we prioritize that at least before the offcom rules kick in in the run up to the election um yeah we've not known obviously- that so far yeah. though so yeah yeah so i mean it's because of the assembly being proportional and because of us being the the third largest group on the assembly um we're we're doing extremely well for coverage of our work at the moment um on the assembly we've 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 yeah we've had loads of really good coverage on the on the regional news on the evening standards doing an awful lot of coverage of, of caroline's work particularly so uh, yeah I, i've not noticed that yet but you yeah you're right i don't think they can turn around and exclude us from debates um any more than they did before and again you know this has always been a problem so it's not like it's going to get much worse i don't think Interesting. Yeah, well, we'll definitely see how that pans out. Um, I'm going to come to some questions from the chat now. So last reminder for people to pop any questions in the chat. Oh, I didn't know there were questions. Um, OK, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so they're, they're, they're always lovely. Our viewers never ask anything too difficult. So Steve C has um, asked, how can the success and influence of the L- Greens on the London Assembly be replicated across the country where there are different systems of first voting, but also how local government works? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, well, this year, I, I talk a lot about the budget 
process because that is a really crucial part of our work every year even if we don't have the cast casting vote what we get during that process is an awful lot of really you know really accountable numbers to do with what's being spent on what and the opportunity to propose changes and access to more information if we need to know something for our budget amendment that information comes back to us far more quickly during that process during that period than normally because often if we ask a difficult mayor's question it can sit there for months they can put that off for a long time but during the budget process we get the answers that we need to make policy proposals um and that's that's something that every councillor group can do and now we've got more groups in different councils across the country i noticed this year um during the budget period so many of our councillor groups posting and talking about their budget amendments campaigning around their budget amendments which is something we've always done as well so i don't know if it's our influence but it's certainly something that greens in councillor groups across the country are using our, our, our premier tactic for influence, which is properly costed proposals at budget time, because they have an influence. If, if you've done a really good one, what happens the following year is the administration comes forwards with that as if it was its own idea. And that's that's the best victory you can get. <laughs> yeah, as the Oxford City Council Green Group finance spokesperson and budget lead, I can very much concur with all of that, including that the administration will bring your uh, budget amendments in the next year. So any councillors watching, highly recommend yeah, and again, uh, that. I as think a having them written down in a budget amendment is, is the proof you need that it was your idea in the first place. Exactly, yes. Um, so I have one last question for you and then I'll let you enjoy the rest of your Easter weekend. Um, so uh, it's unrelated to London again uh, but so obviously in uh, four weeks time now uh, across England we're going to have council elections across the country. Um, the Greens uh, leadership Carla and Adrian have both said that uh, the Green Party is on track to win gain over 100 more seats. Um, firstly how many seats do you think the Greens are going to be winning and uh, how important do you think these elections are coming up? Oh, my goodness. Well, they're super important. So the one of the first things I did six months after I became co-leader was welcome in the equivalent results in 2019. So these are the seats we were defending all these seats that we won in 2019. And there were so many of them. I mean, I had sorry, something just fell down in my flat. Um, I had um, you know the spreadsheet that you get from the, the election team telling us what to look out for, because I'm like I was spending the, the whole night on in the tv and radio studios so i had on my ipad you know access to this spreadsheet where the gains would appear and all of that and each one had you know likely to get or possible and when i was watching it go by so many of the possibles were coming through people were breaking through onto new councils the first time they tried i mean that was extraordinary stuff now this year we're, we're defending those seats and trying to gain new seats on the same councils so I just don't, I just don't know. I mean, in theory, we, we ought to be on for the same magnitude of gains, I would have thought. Not many Green councillors um, win a breakthrough and then lose it. And quite often we can, we can make a further gain based on their hard work. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'd go with what Carla and Adrian say, basically. Yeah. and we're going to delve into more though. it could be more because the you know the possibles we underestimate we're always a bit cautious so that's a beautiful segue to my next interview which is going to be with Al Folan from Stats for Lefties and we're going to be delving into where the Greens could be making some big uh, they will definitely uh, they're their, yeah yeah they're getting their spreadsheets out so yeah um it's been an absolute pleasure as always Sean thank you so much for joining us thank you sorry about my long answers but they were big questions Chris thank you very much they were, yeah <laughs> Next time I get you on, I'll give you really narrow, specific questions instead. Yeah, that's yes, please. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Sean. Cheers.